Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Today I want to continue with the teaching of the book of Galatians, a verse-by-verse -verse commentary. Let's begin now with chapter 4, verse 17. They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you, that ye might affect them. Okay, I'm going to look at that right away in the Amplified. It says, these men, the Judaizers, we got to always remember who we're talking about. Paul is talking about the Judaizers. A Judaizer is a man from Judea, a, a man who's pushing Judaism. And... Uh, a man from James. These are the uh, things that should come to mind when we hear Judaizer. So here in the Amplified, it says, These men, the Judaizers, eagerly seek you to entrap you with honeyed words and attention to win you over to their philosophy. Uh, and, and what is their philosophy? Their belief system is that um, uh, Jesus is the promised Messiah that would come. Put your faith in him. He came for the Jewish people. And we've always practiced Judaism. So we will continue to practice Judaism. And salvation will be earned by a combination of faith in Jesus and our ability to practice Judaism. Uh, as far as the Gentiles are concerned, well, we will grudgingly uh, let the Gentiles participate in this, uh, but they must convert to Judaism. They must get circumcised. They must uh, follow all the, the laws and tenets of Judaism. Um, so they really must be con converted to Judaism and believe in Jesus. So that is their philosophy. That is what they're pushing on uh, all these people who have come to believe in Jesus and they've received the free gift of salvation. Then the Judaizers are coming in and spoiling Paul's work. Uh, making all of these people into apostate believers. Um, according to Paul, Paul calls the Galatian church and call, refers to them as brethren, which is believers. Uh, these are Gentiles, so when he says brethren, it couldn't be referring to, well, we're, we're both Jews, so we're brethren in that sense. No, this brethren for the Gentiles can only mean one thing, that they are believers. So they, Paul is certain that they did believe correctly. Therefore, they did get saved. But now, they've been bewitched and, and uh, they've uh, believed another gospel, which is not another, uh, a, a false gospel, gospel from false teachers. So now they're no longer believing correctly. But as we know, one of the core doctrines of Christianity is that uh, once you're saved, you're always saved. Uh, we have the blessed assurance that we're going to go to heaven no matter what is guaranteed by Jesus, and therefore we have eternal security. Um, so knowing knowing that, the uh, these Galatian um, brethren, they're saved, but they're apostate. They're, they're no longer believing the true gospel. They believe in faith plus Judaism. So Paul is saying, these men, the Judaizers, they are eagerly seeking you to, you to entrap you with honeyed words and attention uh, to win you over to their philosophy. Not honorably, for their purpose is not honorable or, or worthy of consideration. They want to isolate you from us who oppose them. 
So Paul and his uh, disciples, um, they are opposing the Judaizers. And so there is opposition. There are two factions. There's uh, the, the, those people who believe that salvation uh, is completely by faith alone in Christ alone and, and no uh, religious requirements on us uh, are part of, of salvation. That um, we don't have to do any religious works to get saved or to keep our salvation or to prove that we are truly saved. Um, so it's, it's faith alone without any works. And yet the other opposing faction, the Judaizers, their philosophy is you've got to convert to Judaism and practice Judaism, then you can believe in Jesus. Uh, let's go back to KJV in uh, verse 18. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing. And not only when I'm present with you, the Amplified says, now it is always pleasant to be eagerly sought after, provided that is for a good purpose. And not just when I am with you seeking you myself, but beware, the other is doing it. So I think this goes along with the uh, the word bewitched. It, it seems that in Paul thinks that somehow these Judaizers uh, cast a spell and bewitched these um, Galatian believers. Uh, and the way he's saying it now is that it's like they have somehow almost hypnotized you with they just like massaged you and made you feel so good that you've, you've uh, embraced their philosophy their um, uh, uh, false gospel let's go look at 19 in the kjv my little children of whom i travail in birth again until christ be formed in you so Paul refers to the, these Galatian believers as my little children. Um, I would think that he is referring to them as my children in that um, they're a child of God. They're also babes in Christ. They haven't matured. And, and my means that Paul was the originator. He was the one that told them the gospel that led to their salvation. So in that way, we could say that if they are his children, then Paul is their spiritual father. Now, I can see how that makes perfect sense. But the problem we have with that is that the Roman Catholic cult, uh, they will use this verse and the point I just made uh, to justify th their uh, um, an identity uh, as a priest being your father. Um, personally, if I ever have any conversation with a Catholic priest, uh, I don't care about pleasantries and uh, you know, or respect or courtesy. Uh, I, I'm not going to uh, ever refer to a Catholic priest as Father, Father John, Father Bill, Father Walter, whatever it is. No, you're not Father. Uh, even though they will say, well, Paul was the spiritual father of, of his church. Um, so this is the kind of verse that they use to support that. But um, no, the Bible says that we are all, uh, uh, there are, there's no Jew, there's no Gentile, there's no male, there's no female. There is no uh, uh, um, hierarchy 
where uh, where you have the laity and the clergy. Um, I've always had a uh, uh, a disdain for uh, people being elevated above the congregation. Um, even if even if uh, I had a church where or I attended a church where there was a pastor that I absolutely admired and respected and trusted, uh, he's my brother. He, he's not above me. Uh, but many people, whether it's the Roman Catholic cult or even all the various denominations of Protestantism or non-denominationalism, many times people use this, uh, the title, or the, the status of clergy, uh, of a uh, pastor, or, and that to uh, make, put themselves in a position where they can lord it over uh, the, the others in the congregation. Um, I've had some people over the years um, at my home and, and, uh, and uh, here on YouTube tell me they consider me their pastor. Um, and I, I'm, I always, first thing I want everybody to know is I don't want you to ever refer to me as pastor. I'm not against concept of pastors, um, but uh, I, I, I really value the, um, the equality in the church that we're, we are all equal. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, personally, it would be, um, it would just bother me for someone to think that I'm somehow above them. Um, so uh, the only reason I'm going into this is because when I see a verse that I know that a cult uses to support a false uh, uh, doctrine, I want to point out to you that, hey, this is what the kind of verse that they use to support that. Um, so, my little children, of whom I travail in, in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Uh, verse 19 in the Amplified reads, My little children, for whom I am again in the pains of labor until Christ is completely and permanently formed within you. Hmm. Let's, let me consider this a little bit more. Uh, in the KJV, my little children, of whom, so I'm referring to you, I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Um, well, we know that Christ is in the believer, and the Spirit of Christ is in the believer. And earlier in this chapter, Paul referred to them as brethren, which could only mean believer in this case. So if they are believers and they are saved, uh, I wonder why he, it says, I, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Uh, Christ is formed in them. Now, Could, it, could Paul possibly be thinking of uh, that they're children and they're babes in Christ, but, but uh, they haven't matured? But I don't think it's uh, a person's maturity in, in any way affects how much Christ is formed in them. Uh, I think that uh, at the instant of the new, new birth, that all that is done perfectly and completely uh, Christ is not formed in us gradually and more perfectly over time, but in the ample, in the in the KJV, uh, I I just don't know what to think of it. Of whom I travail in birth again. So, in birth again, why would Paul say in birth again? Is he is he? thinking that they could be born again, again, 
No, a, a person can only be born again one time uh, until Christ be formed in you. So in the Amplified, it's even worse. It says, my little children for whom I am again in the pains of labor until Christ is completely and permanently formed within you. So I am at a loss. Uh, if anybody could uh, tell me, uh, teach me on this verse here, because I don't have enough confidence to really uh, in, make sense of this. Um, I guess I could try looking at it in one more translation. Let's uh, let's look at it in the. Uh, uh, let me see Young's literal. Let's go with Young's literal. There it is. Young's literal is uh, set verse 17. Four. Okay. Then we were on verse. Verse 19. Okay. My little children, of whom again I travail in birth till Christ may be formed in you. Well, th th this makes me wonder if, uh, if he's really considering them as brethren and what means believers, because um, it seems like he wants them to have the new birth, of whom again I travail in birth. So, in other words, he is tried to, trying to lead them to salvation so they can have the new birth because he thinks perhaps they, they never believed correctly from the beginning. Uh, maybe he's referring to some, some of the congregation, not all of the congregation. Uh, I'm sure that they're, not everybody in the congregation is, uh, you know, let's say believe perfectly from the beginning and and not everybody has been persuaded and won over by the, the false teachers, the Judaizers either. So there's probably uh, a mixed mixed ba bag of, of uh, varying kinds of beliefs in this church. But it, we know that it is a big problem that uh, um, some, maybe many, maybe most, Probably not all of these people have um, gone apostate. They no longer believe correctly. Now, if they did not believe correctly in the beginning, this would make sense to me that he is, um, uh, I travail in birth again. In other words, I'm, I'm making an attempt again for you to have the new birth. Uh, let's look at Amp, the, the KJV. In verse 20, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. So, well, he would, he certainly would know that uh, um, if, if they believed correctly and they continue to believe correctly, he wouldn't, this would not apply to that type of a person in the church. So in standing in doubt of them, what is he doubting? Is, is, he, is he doubting that they ever got saved at all? Uh, is, is, is he doubting that uh, they, um, uh, they, they no longer believe correctly and now that they're, they're apostate? Let, let me look at the next verse. Tell me, ye that desire to be under law, do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman, but he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Uh, which things are allegory, and he, yes, will explain the allegory. 
for these are the two covenants. So the bondwoman and the free woman represent the two covenants, the, the gold covenant and the new covenant. The one from Mount Sinai, which was the law, and which gendereth to bondage, the law puts us in bondage, which is Agar. Uh, Agar was the handmaid that uh, Abraham and uh, was promised by God that he would have uh, a lot of descendants and, and so much it would be a great nation. And from his descendants, one particular individual would be the Savior and the whole world will be blessed because of this descendant. Uh, and yet, Abraham was married to his wife, Sarah, for, for many, many years, and, and yet uh, she's never conceived. She was considered to be barren. And here she is, at, really at the age of 90 years old. Uh, she finally gives birth. But before that point, uh, since she hadn't given birth, I, I believe that uh, Sarai, Sarah, she was Sarai first and then her name was changed to Sarah, but um, she, she convinced Abraham to have sexual intercourse with her handmaiden, Hagar, who was an Egyptian uh, handmaiden or servant, hired help. Um, I don't think she was a, a slave. Maybe she was, but she she was a handmaid and she worked as a um, not only you know serving Sarah and Abraham, but in this case uh, even serving them in terms of being a, a uh, having a child in Sarah's place. Since Sarah couldn't conceive, uh, she convinced Abraham to have sex with Hagar and have the child because. He's supposed to have a, ch a child, and from that child, a lot of descendants, and yet it hasn't happened. So they decide to do the same thing in, that Adam and Eve did, and that is that they, here's the problem. Uh, you know, God doesn't seem to be solving our problem, so let's take this into our own hands and, uh, and uh, solve the problem ourselves. What was the problem Adam and Eve had was they, they recognized that they were naked, uh, and they wove fig leaves together to cover themselves. Uh, and so through the, their own works, they made the fig leaves. So they were trying to use works to solve their problem instead of just letting God solve the problem for them, just relying on God. Because God said, your, your own works are this... Uh, Thing you put together here with the, the uh, these fig leaves and, and that makes me suspect also that the, the fruit on the tree was a fig tree not an apple um, because the fig tree and the leaves are, is so convenient and right after the fall so perhaps that's the same tree that uh, that they ate from but the point is, Adam and Eve decided to try to solve their problem with their nakedness through their own works. And God, he said, that that's not acceptable. And then God provided a covering for them, which was an animal skin. And in, in order to have an animal skin, of course, the animal has to die. So apparently God sacrificed animals so that the animal skin could be a covering for Adam and Eve. God had to solve the problem. And that's a picture of uh, solving the problem through your own works will never succeed, but, but relying on God to solve your problem through a blood sacrifice, through a death, uh, which is a, a picture of the future uh, uh, Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, where he would have to die to solve our problem. Our problem was sin and mortality, uh, death. So Jesus paid for our sins and he offers you and me the free gift of eternal life. So we're no longer mortal, but we have immortality. 
Um, so that's the uh, the law is uh, is the bond woman because the whenever a person is uh, under the law, it's a form of slavery. You're not free because you've got all these rules and regulations you've got to, to follow. Uh, the less rules, the more freedom. And the more rules or laws that you must abide by, the less free you are. Uh, so the free woman, well, that, that, that represents, the, you know, man's freedom. Okay, we're all free now, uh, but because the Holy Spirit lives in us, the Holy Spirit is transforming us so that our desires and then our actions are in line with what God wants anyway. Um, some people do it much better than others. Some people are absolute failures at spiritual growth and maturity. Some people, uh, they mature quickly and they mature greatly. But we're not... Uh, we're not uh, uh, identical. We're not. Uh, we're individuals. So what we do after our new birth, how how much we mature and at what rate we mature, is all an individual experience. Uh, but it is written that Abraham had two sons: the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was the bondwoman was born after the flesh. <clears throat> but the he of the free woman was by promise. So the free woman was Sarah, and by promise, that means God's promised Abraham and Sarah, you're going to have a child, and it's going to result in you having many descendants. And one particular descendant will be the Savior of the world. And so here's the promise, but Sarah didn't believe it. And she convinced Abraham, kind of like Eve convinced Adam. Now, women are not the cause of all of our problems, but it is interesting in these cases how uh, it seems to me that women uh, are the first to doubt God, and then they put the doubt in the mind of the man. Um, Verse 24 says, which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, that's Hagar, and that's legalism, that's Judaism, uh, which gendereth bondage, uh, which is Agar, uh, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which, is, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is, above, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Let me look at 26 in the Amplified. And Jerusalem above is the free woman, which is mother of us all. Hmm. Well, when this says, and the Jerusalem above, uh, could this be talking about the new Jerusalem that we have described in the book of Revelation uh, because it does say but Jerusalem which is above so there's a there is a Jerusalem that's not above it's just on level ground I don't know if Jerusalem is sea level or what elevation it is but it's not above but there's another Jerusalem the new Jerusalem uh, that we have described in the book of Revelation that will come down from heaven and either be on earth or uh, close to earth. I'm not sure, uh, but that is the new Jerusalem. And that, I think, is what Paul's referring to here. He says, And the Jerusalem above is the free woman, which is mother of us all. For it hath been written, Rejoice, O barren, who art not bearing. Break forth and cry, thou who art not travailing, because many are the children of the desolate, more than of her having the husband. 
and we, brethren, as Isaac, are children of promise. So Isaac is the promised child that came from as a result of Abraham and Sarah. Even in their old age, God kept his promise and she gave birth at 90 years old and the child was Isaac. The child that Hagar had was Ishmael. And so they're half brothers, Ishmael and Isaac. Both uh, of them have Abraham as the father, but with Ishmael, Hagar is the mother, and with Isaac, Sarah is the mother. Sarah is the one that was uh, of promise. God made the promise to Sarah and Abraham, and Hagar, she's the one of bondage, of, of the law, the old covenant. And I've always found it very interesting that if you track track the the genealogy of Ishmael and track the genealogy of Isaac, you see the nation of Israel coming from Isaac, and you have the Middle Eastern Muslim nations are the descendants of Ishmael. And this is why we have had for all these centuries, and even today, this conflict between the uh, the descendants of Ishmael, believing that he was the firstborn, legitimately he was the firstborn. The firstborn is supposed to have get the inheritance, uh, but he was illegitimate because he was not born as a result of Abraham and Sarah, which was God's what God intended, which was what God promised. Uh, so because Abraham and Sarah and took it in their own hands to bring Hagar into it. Now they have a problem that's lasted for thousands of years between, in, in the Middle East between Israel and the Palestinians, say, or the, the Muslims. Both sides think that uh, their, their side is the one that deserves the promised land. Ishmael being the the one they tra they trace their ancestry back to Ishmael, the the Muslim and the Palestinians, the the Jewish people trace their ancestry back to Isaac. But God intended for Isaac to be the the heir, the promised one. And the only reason Ishmael exists is because Abraham and Sarah didn't believe God. They lost their faith and decided something, something's wrong here. All these years and Sarah's remained barren, so God hasn't kept his promise, so we better take this into our own hands and you have a child with Hagar, my handmaiden. And look at the problems that came as a result of them losing their faith, not trusting God, even though Abraham is called this great man of faith, and because Abraham was justified because he believed God. He believed God, but then at some point he lost his faith. Then, of course, he, went, he got, you know, he got his faith back. But at least for a while, Abraham lost his faith. Otherwise, he would never consented to having a child with Hagar. He would have said, no, God's promised you and I are going to have a child, Sarah. And I believe in God's promise still. But he relented. Was it because Sarah nagged him so much or because he lost his faith? I don't know for sure. I assume it's because he lost his faith. Uh, verse 29 in the KJV. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. So that's uh, uh, really all the descendants. Uh, of uh, Ishmael. You got Ishmael, it says, is persecuting him who was born after the Spirit. And some people could argue that's still going on today. That uh, the descendants of Ishmael, the Palestinians, the, the Muslim nations, they are persecuting the descendant of, uh, you know, of Isaac, the descendant of Isaac, which was born after the Spirit. 
even so it is now. So Paul says, even so it is now. So, you know, uh, all the time that passed from Abraham to Paul, he says it's been going on and it's even occurring even now, Paul says. And I'm saying to you, it's occurring even now in the 21st century. Verse 30, nevertheless, what saith the scripture? <clears throat> Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. That's exactly what uh, they did. Uh, Sarah and Abraham decided that they would have to cast out Ishmael and his mother, Hagar. Cast them out. Uh, God intervened so that they would be not die in the wilderness. And somehow, not only did they survive, but they prospered and became very prosperous, very powerful. And as I said, Ishmael is the father of all these Muslim nations. Uh, but it says, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So the Bible clearly says, no, Islam is wrong. You're not, uh, you cannot uh, um, have the, uh, become co-heirs, or as really in, uh, the, the descendants of Ishmael, they don't really want to have be co-heirs. They, they want the promised land. They want all the uh, nation of Israel for, for their own. Uh, so it's not a question of sharing the uh, becoming co-heirs. But that's what the scripture says here. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So the scriptures are saying, no, that's not going to happen. They're not going to be sharing that land and uh, and also sharing the promise that somehow through the descendant no the, the descendant that Jesus is traced through is uh, Isaac the, the little lineage goes Abraham and Isaac Jacob Judah Jesse David Jesus now there's others in the line there that are not mentioned in the scripture, but those are the ones that are mentioned. Those are the names of the seeds of the genealogy leading from Abraham to Jesus. Verse 31, So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So that really, that last verse is summing up the, the whole point that, look, the, the bondwoman represents bondage, uh, slavery, um, no freedom, because you're, you're uh, under bondage to the law, legalism, Judaism, religion. Uh, we're no, that's not, that's, he says, we are not children of the bondwoman. So if you've ever put your faith in Jesus, then you're, you're a child of God. It says, we are not children of the bondwoman. So as a child of God, we're not children of the bondwoman. The, the Hagar and, and, uh, and religion is, is not what uh, we are supposed to be um, uh, abiding in. We, we abide in grace and, uh, and uh, uh, freedom. Let me read that last verse in the KJV. Then, brethren, we are not a maid servant's children, but the free woman's. So he said in verse, uh, where was it? The word allegory. Uh, well, I can't see find the word allegory right now, but at one point Paul says that 
this example of the bond woman and the free woman is an allegory uh, representing the old covenant and the new covenant. So in the new covenant, it's absolutely no religion, no rules and regulations, no legalism, no Judaism, only free gift salvation. Salvation that Jesus offers everyone is offered freely as a gift. You don't have to work for it, earn it, um, purchase it. No, there's nothing you can do to, to get it through your own efforts. Jesus did all the work. He lived a perfect, sinless life. Jesus bought it. The Bible says that we were bought with a price. God's uh, own blood was shed. So Jesus suffered, died, bled, and died. That's the price that he bought us this gift. The gift is eternal life. He paid for all your sins. So sin is not preventing you from having a relationship with God now. Sins are paid for. The only thing that's preventing you from having a relationship with God as a child of God is faith in Jesus completely. And when you do put your faith in Jesus completely and you have this relationship is established, the Holy Spirit of God comes into you and lives in you permanently. And you are your spirit is brought to life so that you're um, now you're born again spiritually and you're a new creature in Christ, a born again child of God. So, um, this is what happens when a person rejects religion, puts no faith in religion, puts no faith in personal merit. But instead, their plea to God is not, oh God, I deserve heaven because of all the things I've done. No, their plea to God is, I'm not deserving, but Jesus died for my sins. And he promised I would have eternal life in heaven if I trusted him. And I put all my faith in Jesus. That's, that's our only plea. All right. Uh, now, the, this video today, uh, there were several points that uh, I, I wish I had more confidence uh, as I discussed a couple of the verses. But a couple of the verses actually confounded me. So um, uh, in those areas particularly, if you do have a better answer, I hope you will take the time to comment uh, to help me out uh, because um, I don't have all the answers. Uh, I'm not only not, I am not omniscient, which means knowing everything. No, I don't know everything in the scriptures. Uh, but I'm, uh, I'm certainly not infallible. Or not, uh, it is certainly possible for me to make a mistake. I've made some in the past, and when people would debate me and they proved me wrong, I would not be a stubborn fool and hold on to my error. Well, I, I accepted that, hey, I was wrong, and now I'm glad that you told me the truth. So that's the same thing I would uh, ask today, is if you think that uh, I'm wrong in anything in these teachings here, uh, let me know exactly what it is. But don't just make some single sentence you know, statement just to uh, you know, put me down. Uh, tell me with good reasoning you know, how I'm wrong and what the right thing is and why. And uh, I would greatly appreciate that. Okay, so the next time I'll, I'll pick it up with uh, uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.